Uh, thank everybody for, for coming. Um, my name is Derek Ersbeck. I'm a senior project manager at Peter Grocer. Uh, quick little background, I grew up in uh, the Poconos. Um, my family was caretakers to large plots of lands on the order of thousands of acres of uh, unfor with forested mountains, creeks, streams for hunting and fishing. Um, so we took care of them and, and uh, managed those lands. Um, I went to Binghamton University, got my uh, Bachelor of Science there in Ecology, Evolution, and Behavior, and I moved out to the island, and I've been with Peter Grocer since 2006. Um, I joined Long Island Association of Professional Geologists probably, uh, I started going to the meetings as soon as I came, but I probably joined the board maybe eight years ago. Uh, I served as secretary for a couple of years and then had to relinquish that. And now I'm just uh, on the board helping out wherever I can. Um, after this presentation, uh, for those of you who'd like to test their knowledge, we do have a um, sort of like a Jeopardy, uh, a two-part Jeopardy um, that takes some questions from this presentation and then also some questions off of the actual ASBOG exams. So you kind of test your knowledge. Um, no prizes, it's all multiple choice. Uh, we'll get through a couple of them, then we'll read the answers. And if anybody has a question of, you know, why is that? And then we'll open the floor up to geologists to try and explain it to everyone. Um, so I'm gonna start off. Um, so I, I came up with this idea because uh, once this whole pan pandemic started, um, you're really limited what people could do. You know, you couldn't go out in mass gatherings. You couldn't do normal things. Um, the benefit of it, though, is I saw that a lot of people um, that normally wouldn't get out in nature started to do that again. And, you know, that's a, a great thing that we have out there that I don't think many people had utilized prior to this. And so now that people are getting out there, they're exploring. Um, and doing that, I saw that New York has a lot to offer. The other thing is, I focus this on New York is because, you know, with all the quarantine stuff going on, you know, there's fears of leaving the state and then having to come back. So I sort of focus this on New York um, to see geology we have here and tons of sites that we can visit so you don't have to feel like we're trapped and uh, you can get out. Um, so I'm going to start off with a quick tailgate safety meeting before we start. Um, so here's some ground rules for going to explore, especially when you're out in the nature. Make sure you have proper equipment for hike you're setting out to do. Always bring enough water and a flashlight. If you're going out alone, tell someone where you're going and when you plan on getting back, that's important. If you're bringing a furry friend or young children, check the trail to make sure it's suitable for them and that furry friends are allowed. Most trails in New York are, are pet friendly. Um, unless you're in certain parks, they have a lot of picnic areas, then they don't allow that. Um, most hiking trails are carry out what you carry in. Um, unfortunately, not everybody abides by that. So I always bring a little bag and I attach it to my backpack. And anytime I see litter on the ground, I pick it up because it shouldn't be there. Uh, that's just rude. Um, so everything we can do to help keep these trails in decent shape, uh, try and do. Um, when you're going out, there's some good hiking apps, so you don't need to worry about orienteering nowadays. Back in the day, you used to have a map and a compass. Uh, you don't really need that anymore. Um, there are still areas, surprisingly. I went to the Catskills uh, last week where I had no cell service. Uh, without cell service, it doesn't work too well. But a lot of these apps allow you to pre-download the maps, and your GPS will still work on your phone without cell service. Um, I use an app called All Trails, uh, which if you buy the pro version, you can download all the maps and uh, you're all set. You won't have any issues no matter where you go. I was using it in Peru um, in the middle of nowhere and it was fine. All right. So now we're going to get into um, several sites that I've researched. Some of them I've been to. Uh, some of them I plan on going to. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Can I get a thumbs up if you can see the screen? All right. We're going to go. Um, so here's a, a list uh, I came up with. Um, 
we're going to go through these from the top to the bottom. They're not necessarily in order of different zones of New York. Um, I wasn't that organized. I sort of just went through the ones that I thought were cool and then sort of worked my way down. So we're going to start uh, with probably one of the largest features and longest hikes um, out there for uh, New York. Um, so the first thing we come to is the, the Catskill Escarpment. Um, what this is, it's a, a series of mountains forming the northeast corner of the Catskill Mountains. You begin with Overlook Mountain in the south, and it runs all the way to Wyndham High Peak in the north. It's approximately 24 miles long with numerous uh, peaks. And we're going to go through a little bit of the geology of how this was formed and then sort of some of the cool features that you can see um, on this hike. So um, Catskill Escarpments. Um, it, it owes its formation to three phases in different geological epochs. Um, so we, to start, we have to go back about 400 million years ago. Uh, the Catskill region was a river delta uh, and shallow sea it drained into. During this time, the escarpment limestone bedrock began forming. Uh, the river carried eroded materials from the Taconic Mountains to the northeast. At that time, the Taconic Mountains were roughly 15,000 feet in elevation. Um, if those mountains were still at that elevation in existence today, they'd be the second tallest in the United States, with only one mountain uh, taller than that, and that's in Alaska called Denali. I actually went to Denali several years ago, and it's pretty impressive. Um, so later, the sea became the deeper Appalachian Basin, and the sand and clay from the newer mountains became the shale and sandstone found throughout the Catskills today. Over time, the seafloor began to drain and uplift. The area of today's escarpment had been the river's distributaries and had the thickest layer of Devonian sediments. Leading to leading to uplift as a whole and became a plateau. Plateau. So basically, what we're seeing for the escarpment at one time was a plateau straight up. Um, gradually, the upper levels of the plateau began to erode and create stream basins, resulting in the mountains and valleys seen today. Um, then, about hundred thousand three hundred thousand years ago, we had glaciers come through, which made it even steeper. Um, and during this time, uh, Catterskill Clove was carved out and that resulted in the formation of the Catterskill Falls, which we have some pictures of and, and we'll show you. Um, so that's pretty much how it forms. Uh, if you go to the escarpment, you have really uh, flat land and then just mountains going straight up. You don't have mountains smaller mountains and that it's really flat land on the Hudson Valley, goes straight up to the escarpment and it was formed uh, through that process. Um, keep in mind of that process because we're going to go talk a lot more about that at some of the other sites in the Catskills, following similar, similar process of how they were formed. Um, so as you can see, the escarpment trail uh, is a 24 mile trail that starts on the south here of Overlook Mountain and ends at Wyndham. You don't necessarily have to do all those, uh, that, that entire hike. There's other ones you can do. Uh, another name for the Catskill uh, Escarpment is the Great Wall of Manitou, uh, or its geologists call it the Catskill Front. So as far as features that you can see on it, um, when you start at the southern end, you're roughly at about elevation 1,700. Um, as you hike the trail north, you'll be climbing numerous mountain peaks up to an elevation of 3,420 feet. So it's quite a quite steep hike in some of these areas. Um, lots of uh, viewpoints on top of these mountains. You can see the entire Hudson Valley. Um, Probably about halfway through, you have North South uh, Lake and the campgrounds there. That's a good place uh, to either start the hikes or um, do only half of it. 
Uh, what this trail does allow is once you get past that north uh, mountain, you can camp on the trail as long as you're 150 feet off of the trail. Um, so on this, you can see a picture of Catterskill Falls. It's a, it's a two-tier fall. Uh, and this is what we were talking about. The, the glaciers carved this out um, about 100,000 to 300,000 years ago. Um, it drops over two tiers, like we said, and the Devonian sandstone and is present there. And then when you're at North Lake, uh, you know, the rocks there, you can find glacial striations. All right, so here's the different trails you can do. As I said, the, the one from south to north is roughly 24 miles. Um, it's rated as an expert level. Like I said, you are going up some very steep hills and just by the length of it. Something that's a lot uh, easier, like I said, you could camp at the north-south uh, lake and you can do a loop there, which is 10.6. Or if you just want an easy trail, uh, you can do Artist Rack and Sunset Rock, um, which is 1.8 miles, also from the campground. So that's the escarpment. Um, next thing we're going to move on to is Panther Mountain. Um, I went to visit this last week while I was in the Catskills. Um, if anybody notices anything unique, it has a nice circular pattern. Um, so what could that be? So a geologist by the name of Ingvar Isaacson uh, first noticed a circular pattern um, in the 70s and wondered what was going on here. Um, he noticed that the circular feature was formed by the esophagus creek. Um, you guys can see that outlined in the black there. Um, circular, circular features like this um, don't typically happen without something happening. So he was wondering, how could this happen? And there's three geological possible explanations. The first would be a volcanic caldera. Um, second would be dynamical uplift, kind of like what we were talking about earlier in the formation of um, the mountains. And then the third one would be a meteor impact crater. Um, so he thought about these three processes and he looked at each one. Volcanic caldera, it doesn't make sense. There's no uh, volcanic rock in the Catskills. So check that one's not, not what it is. Domical uplift. Um, he ruled that out because there's no core of igneous rock and no tilted and full of sed sedimentary rocks along the flanks. Um, First look, a meteor crater doesn't seem right. It's not a crater. You have a circle and then a mountain in the middle, a bunch of mountains. Normally with craters, you have a whole, a whole big depression in the ground. Um, so he was kind of flabbergasted at what it was. So he went and did more research. Um, he thought, he still thought it could be a meteor crater. Um, like I said, typically they leave depressions, but that doesn't mean that the landscape couldn't have changed after that depression happened. So he went and did a series of tests. So the first thing he did, he walked along the esophagus creek. And he noticed that there was extensive jointing, fracturing in the bedrock of the streams. If you look at the lower right corner there, that's the, the bedrock in the streams of the esophagus creek. Um, these joints are spaced about a foot apart. Um, water has a preference to erode away rock where it is weaker, so areas of bedrock with joints will erode quicker from the quick rattling. Um, so then he said, why did the jointing form this circular pattern? That's a possibility of a meteor impact crater. Next thing he did is um, he found out that a while ago somebody else looked at this and they saw the possible for domical uplift, which could result in you know having shale present with natural gas. So they drilled a nat natural gas well here, 6,000 feet into this mountain. Um, and luckily they saved the cuttings. 
he took a look at those cuttings and he found uh, presence of iron rich glassy spherules and shot coarse crystal. Now, iron rich glassy spherules form when iron meteorites impact, vaporize, and then rain out little spherules uh, which settle back to Earth. And then shot quartz forms when crystalline lattice of quartz mineral grains experience shock waves and rearrange in parallel. And then the third clue he had is um, he got a hold of an instrument called a gravitometer, which measures the Earth's gravitational field. Higher density rock results in stronger gravitational field, and lower density rocks result in lower gravitational field. The rocks beneath Panther Mountain have a lower density, which is consistent with broken rocks expected in a meteorite crater. Uh, based on this data, he theorizes that this is a meteor impact crater. Um, figuring out why there's mountains there, we got to go back to our previous discussion on the escarpment back 400 million years ago before the escarpment formed. What do we have? We had the river delta. So he theorizes that this impact happened 400 million years ago at the time when we had that river dumping into the sea. It slammed into the sea, formed a crater. Over time, um, the, uh, it filled in and then the mountains formed within it. Um, the creek remained because the water continues to erode around it. So that's the, the geological explanation of Panther Mountain. So now we're going to go a little bit more into the hiking and exploring it. So I actually did this hike last week. This is um, Giant Ledge and Panther Mountain. Uh, it's pretty strenuous, but it's it, we did it with our dog. Um, it, was quite amazing. Um, so we're going to talk about that, talk about the campground that's nearby, and then the most important stuff, the breweries and the distilleries that are nearby that you can stop in to, to quench your thirst. All right, here we are. Um, we did the giant ledge hike, which is a, a mile and a half straight up the mountain. Um, you climb roughly 1,500 feet in elevation uh, in a mile and a half, which is Pretty intense. Um, once you get to the top, though, the views are amazing. Here's a view from Giant Ledge looking over Panther Mountain. Um, pretty amazing. The other thing that I th th kind of found that was cool is there's no roads that go through that seven mile circle. You got to drive all the way around it. It's just one giant mountain. They didn't seem it, think it was feasible to, to build any roads. So you really are out in the middle of nowhere. All right. Now let's get to the good part. So even though you're out in the middle of nowhere, they seem to have plenty of breweries and distilleries. Um, I did visit all four of these, not in the same day. Um, upward Brewing, up in the left there, it's in um, the Catskills, just opened, um, so I'm very surprised they were able to stay open. Um, so here's a little uh, pitch for them. Born from the natural springs of a 20-acre preserve called Beer Mountain. Grab a brew or bite to eat and enjoy the chalet-style brewery, play cornhole outside, or take a beer for a hike up the mountain trails. Um, Catskill Brewery. The Catskill Brewery makes fresh ales and lagers using the best local natural ingredients. Grab a brew and sit outside until under the covered deck and grab a bite to eat from the rotating local food truck lineup. Um, now another little town that's nearby is called Roscoe. You've got the Roscoe Beer Company. It's built in a former firehouse. Roscoe Beer Company provides a diverse range of brews and eats to be enjoyed in a spacious outdoor beer garden where live tunes can be enjoyed. And then something that was really cool was this Prohibition uh, Distillery. Um, it's built in a former firehouse and VFW bu building. This distillery is churning out vodka, gin, and New York style whiskey. Um, they do very, uh, they like to educate you here on what spirits actually taste like um, in their purest form without any sort of additives or harmful um, alcohols that a lot of uh, distilleries put in there to uh, make it cheaper and hide 
uh, taste or just distilling, distilling things incorrectly. So I would definitely recommend checking these sites out and just providing them as stuff to do up there because if you're not into hiking, uh, it's all woods out there besides camping and a couple of little, little towns. All right. Here we are at Mongot Park. Um, it's actually a pretty large campsite. Um, they have some nice trails around it. Um, that's my dog in the middle there. All right, now we're moving to the Finger Lakes. Um, this is Tuganock Falls. So as we move west out of the Catskills, we arrive in the Finger Lakes. We've skipped over Cooperstown and all that middle central. There's not much there. Um, you cannot leave the Finger Lakes without visiting Watkins Glen and Tuganock Falls. For this presentation, I elected to highlight Tuganock Falls. Um, when I went, it was the middle of winter and most of Watkins Glen was closed. Um, try and visit these sites uh, in the summer, the spring, in the winter. It just becomes too icy to go see anything. As you can see in this picture, it was about negative 17 on this day. Um, much of the waterfall was actually frozen, but it was actually really neat. All right, um, Tugnuff Falls. Uh, it's a 750-acre state park located in the town of Ulysses and is home to the Toganoff Giant, which you see behind me. The Toganoff Giant, or Toganoff Falls, is a 250-foot plunge waterfall that is the highest single-drop waterfall east of the Rocky Mountains, higher than Niagara Falls, higher than any other waterfall that you can think of east of the Rockies. Um, what's also nice is to get to this waterfall, you got to walk through a gorge, and it's a, it's a beautiful gorge. Um, not to take anything away, anything away from Watkins Glen, but this is actually really nice, too. Um, so leading up to the falls, the massive gorge, which when combined with the waterfall, is what we call a hanging valley. Not a geological term there. When we walk through the gorge, you can observe, observe distinct layering. The floor of the gorge is a light gray limestone. The crumbling walls of the gorge are shale, and the top of the cliff walls are sturdier layers of sandstone and siltstone. Um, so the gorge has been created through a combined process of chemical and physical weathering. Uh, for the chemical, you have slightly acidic rain, results in pitting of the limestone. And then, as you can see in the previous picture, in the winter, you have freezing and thawing of the gorge walls, results in splitting of the shale into fragments. Um, the gorge continues to retreat westward from Cayuga Lake. All right. You've seen a theme here, aren't you? Breweries and vineyards in the Finger Lakes. You can't go to the Finger Lakes without visiting some of the, obviously, tons of wineries, but they also have good breweries as well. Um, these are three that I recommended. Toro uh, Run Winery. Um, they specialize in French-style wines. Um, very neat. Standing Stone Vineyards, I know Chris is going to be visiting this one soon. They have a unique grape um, called a Saparevi. The Saparevi is native to the Republic of Georgia and produce very deep red wines that are suitable for extended aging. So we actually bought a bottle and held on to it for uh, two years and then opened it and it was just delicious. And then they have their fair share of breweries. Uh, Lucky Hair Brewing Company here. Pretty small uh, brewery, but uh, really neat drinks, uh, unique beers. All right, moving on. So now we're, uh, for those Western New Yorkers, uh, we're, uh, we're out in Buffalo. Okay, the Eternal Flame Falls. Uh, we're now moving even further west to those who share the border with our Canadian neighbors. Well, the name for this feature may be called the Eternal Flames Falls. It's actually a natural gas leak which can be lit and remains lit most of the time. Um, if you're going to visit this, bring a lighter just in case it is not lit at the time. Um, so when they've researched this, they've identified there's a natural occurring hydrocarbon seep originating from the Rhine Street Shale, approximately 1300 feet below the falls. Um, they believe it was happened, tectonic activity likely opened faults in the shale uh, and caused this seep. 
Um, these happen quite often all over the place. Um, just this one's kind of unique that, that it sort of lines up where it is actually in a waterfall. Um, let's see, I have some pictures. This one can be a little hard to find. Um, I've included a map. Uh, we'll share this presentation. If you go to Chestnut Ridge Park, you can see the map here. It's actually highlighted on the bottom right here. You actually have to get off of the main trails and follow a trail through the woods, uh, which isn't really marked well. But if you follow this map or if you have the All Trails app, you can get to it. And like I said, bring a lighter in case it is extinguished when you're there. All right. Uh, moving on to the Ellenville Fault Ice Caves. So we're retreating back to the Catskills. Um, we've come in search of year-round ice from, for our cocktails. Uh, it can be found at the Ellenville Fault Ice Caves. All right, so we're back in the Catskills and we arrive within Sam's Point Preserve located with, within Minnewaska State Park and the Ellenville Fault Ice Caves. Uh, the Ellenville Fault Ellenville ice caves are unlike other caves in the Northeast, which consist of limestone, which is easy to erode and dissolve by water. These caves instead consist of extremely hard and insoluble quartz conglomerate. Uh, when underlying rocks, rock layers were folded by tectonic movement, the hard conglomerate separated along existing joints in the cracks, which formed the uh, faults. Um, the caves uh, were formed by the natural refrigeration system built in. As air moves over top of the crevices, the colder air, heavy air sinks down into the caves and then it becomes trapped in these caves. Um, and there's been documentation of people finding ice in the middle of summer in these deep crevices, uh, just because it stays so cold um, with the cold air sinking. Unfortunately, uh, the caves are closed right now um, because of it. They're, real uh, thin corridors and it just doesn't allow for social distancing. Uh, it also becomes very crowded too here, so they don't let as many people in. Um, Chris actually sent me an alternative to this, which is Bear Hill Preserve in Cragsmore, New York. Very similar feature. Um, this is actually private land where they uh, allow public use. Um, very similar. Uh, with the Ellenville Fault ice caves being well known and heavily trafficked tourist attractions, um, those seeking similar geology with more freedom, Bear Hill Preserve is what you're searching for. Unfortunately, once again, this place is currently closed. Uh, same types of restrictions. Um, hopefully, once the they're lifted, um, if you prefer um, not as crowded places, you don't want to wait in line, come visit this. It's very similar to the Ellenville Fault ice caves. All right, moving on, we come to fossils. I think Andy said he wanted to learn about some fossils. So we come to Lester's, Lester Park's tropical seafloor. All right, so now we're heading up towards Saratoga, uh, heading into the Adirondacks. Um, this one can be hard to find. It's just on the side of the road. Um, so as we head up to around us, we take a quick stop on the side of the road to hunt for fossils just northeast of Saratoga. Um, we're gonna head back to the beginning of my presentation um, when we were talking about the landscape of the Adirondacks and the Catskills. What was it? It was a seafloor. So we had seafloor some 400 million years ago. The fossils you'll see in Lester Park are called stromatolites, which means layered rocks. So manolites are formed in very shallow marine waters by cyanobacteria, and that's blue-green algae. Uh, there are layers reflect growth spurts of the mats that may correspond to tidal cycles. Um, if you look really hard, you'll also see uh, snails, trilobites, tracheopods within this, this fossil uh, bed. All right. The one site I picked for um, Long Island, the Walking Dunes. All right, moving a bit closer to all of us, we're back on Long Island. 
While Long Island has plenty of parks and hiking trails, one may think we lack significant geological features. However, that's simply a matter of opinion as the bluffs along North Shore can be pretty impressive and provide excellent sunrises and sunsets. Another feature that was recommended to me this year was the walking dunes out in Montauk. So I actually decided to go check it out and see what was all, what was all about it. Um, so the walking dunes are located in Hither Hill State Park in Montauk. Um, if you go to Hither Hill Park, you may miss it. It's actually a side road that's, that's not even labeled. Um, if you want to know how to get there, I, I can give you directions. Uh, pretty much you make the first left before you get to Hithers Hills and you keep on driving until it ends. There's no parking lot. You just park on the road and you, you can go back and then walk. Um, so we all know do dunes form along beaches and that they're continuous living. What makes the walking dunes special? Uh, the walking dunes are not ordinary beach dunes. The walking dunes consist of three parabolic dunes that reach up to 80 feet in height which have been over, which have been over many years, slowly progressing or walking towards the southeast. As they move, they swallow up the forest floor on their way. So here's the sign you get when you get to the walking dunes. And here's some pictures of the walking dunes. So the picture on the top right is actually on top of the dunes. You can see the forest floor below. This forest floor in 100 years will be swallowed up by this dune. It will be engulfed. Um, it is estimated that these dunes formed about 100 years ago as prevailing northwest winds have been blowing sand from nearby headlands to the shore, causing the dunes to walk. It is estimated that dunes move 3.5 feet a year. So it is a slow progression, but um, if you've ever been here, you can actually see on the edge of these dunes, they're starting to overtake the forest. I forgot to add it on this PowerPoint slide, but if you're driving out to Montauk, you might as well stop in the Montauk Brewery and grab a, a beer. All right, uh, we're getting close to the end, so let's head back up to uh, the northernmost point that we have on this trip, and that's the Osable Chasm. Um, we're back upstate to our northernmost sites in, in the Adirondacks, the Osable Chasm. Similar to the other gorges we discussed, um, the Osable Chasm is a sandstone gorge which has been carved out by the Osable River with Rainbow Falls leading the way. Um, the gorge measures a little over a mile long uh, and varies in width and height from as little as 20 to 50 feet in width uh, to as deep as 300 to 500 feet. Um, Remember, we got to go back uh, to our earlier discussions. The path of the gorge is controlled by joints in the sandstone and faults. Um, this river's changed course uh, over its time, so there's actually dry canyons you can walk through that used to be river bends. Um, unlike other sites we've discussed, the Osable Chasm is kind of a tourist trap. Um, you got to pay to get in. You got to there's tubing, to all sorts of things. So if you're into that kind of stuff, it'd be great for a family trip, but it might be a little heavy on the wallet. All right. And then here's some information on that. All right. So after all that hiking, our, our muscles are sore, our joints are sore. Um, let's take a dip in the, the Pecomus Blue Hole. Um, Swimming in, the, in this blue hole, uh, the water is always cold. Um, ice baths are thought to constrict blood vessels, flush waste products, and reduce swelling and tissue breakdown. Um, I did go swimming in the Picamus Blue Hole. It was freezing. Okay, Picamus Blue Hole is located in Sundown Wild Forest. Uh, the Blue Hole is a depression in the stream bed rock formed by sand and swirling gravel in an ancient whirlpool. Um, as of late, uh, since most of the blue holes are, are closed, the ones in uh, Woodstock are closed, this has become a huge um, uh, tourist area. Um, your state's actually is, is issuing permits on the weekend to limit the amount of people that come. Uh, if you do go, um, 
the main blue hole is normally crowded, but there's plenty of other ones as you go downstream. We actually went to one of these and it's just as nice and less crowded. Uh, what's pretty unique is this water is crystal clear and these holes are pretty deep. Um, I actually brought some of my snorkeling gear and I was able to dive down to the bottom of these holes. And the rocks that are down there are just polished, round, amazing. Um, so do bring that. Um, and that's it for some of the places I've been to and some of the places I want to go see. And there's plenty more. Um, we were talking earlier, I'm going to be heading up to uh, the Adirondacks for Labor Day. I'm going to go see, um, there's some geysers in Saratoga Springs. There's um, tons of trails out in the Adirondacks. So hopefully I can elaborate on this and, and add more. And we'll put this uh, video up on our website um link to this presentation and if anybody wants to know where these are or how to get to them or advice um you can email me and i can reach out um so that's it i'm going to unmute people and if you guys have any questions i'll see what i can answer Anybody have any questions you'd like to ask? If not, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Jen and we'll, we'll start the, the trivia. I'm going to see if I can get everybody unmuted because uh, we were still all on mute before Derek, so maybe somebody had some questions, but we couldn't hear them. Uh, so just give us a second to figure that out. We want to ask about that uh, flame in... Eternal flame holes? Eternal flame holes. Sure. Uh, why the flame extinguish and why it has to be lighted with the lighter? So, so typically, um, depends on how much gas is coming out at the time. Also, you have buffalo cold temperatures. You got the waterfalls right there. Um, if it was not in a waterfall condition, more than likely you could light it and it would stay lit. Um, but the fact that you do have that added in there, I'm assuming that's probably why it goes out. But they say, they say uh, based on the research, I, I haven't been to this site, but based on the research, I said most of the time it is lit. Did anybody else have any other questions? If, uh, if you don't have the ability to uh, use audio, please type it in the chat and we will address it. 